Thank you for joining us. We're excited to bring you a discussion on cultural and identity in special operations. Straight Talk with Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann. To win the war of the future, U.S. Special Operations Command must find new ways to engage, recruit, and train operators. Reconsidering who is enlisted and how they are selected is a key step in maintaining SOFT's unconventional competitive edge. Leaders must capitalize on the momentum from the 2020 Comprehensive Review on the Special Operations Cultural and Ethics to build more diverse teams that will thrive in the evolving operating environment. As research from Deloitte highlighted recently, even though culture reigns as one of the greatest soft attributes, leaders can't let it completely eat strategy for breakfast. Current special operations forces are simply too homogenous and too focused on kinetic operations to succeed in the coming war for influence. As the command shifts away from violent kinetic raids against terrorists, special forces must adapt to defend against a dynamic enemy. Special operations forces must reorient and diversify their collective skill sets to compete against state and non-state adversaries. Reorienting towards cultural impacts and investigating identity will continue to be a key component of global security today. The type of and diversity of threats in the war for influence demand ongoing development and cultural understanding. At Mission Essential, we're constantly architecting language and cultural solutions for DOD, and we're always grateful to partner with experts in the community to identify ways to make a positive impact. So we hope this conversation will continue to inform and inspire you. With that, I'm privileged to introduce our expert today, retired Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann, who spent 23 years in the United States Army, 18 of that as a Green Beret, where he specialized in unconventional, high-impact missions all over the world, including Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Panama, Iraq, and Afghanistan. He's the author of two internationally best-selling books, Game Changers and Straight Talk about military transition. He's given three TED Talks and is the founder of Rooftop Leadership and the nonprofit organization Hero's Journey. Welcome, Lieutenant Colonel Mann, and thank you for your sacrifices, your service, and for being with us today. And I just wanted to add on a personal note that the work you do for Hero's Journey is so amazing, and I truly appreciate the impact of that nonprofit. Hey, thanks, Brian. It's good to be here. And, you know, a big focus for all of us, I think, should be helping bring our warriors home and their families home from service as they transition. That's something that all of us, I think, can can get our head around. Well, I appreciate that so much. And I think uh, well, I'll be with you on that fight wherever you go. So consider me part of your troops. Thank you. And um, and all the great work you do. So appreciate it. Yeah. And so so we recently talked with uh, Colonel Ed Crew, um, who I believe you're familiar with. And and the potential identity crisis within special forces. And Colonel Crute's exhaustive research identified a disconnect between recruitment, training, and deployment, right? So today, what, what I'd like to talk about is getting your perspective on this research and particularly how leadership and communication are foundational to developing the future of special operations, right? So I guess where we can start is, do you see an identity crisis within special forces and uh, or special operations? And if so, where? Well. Yes, I, I, I do. Um, I, I'll jump right into that. I, I think, first of all, what I'd like to do, Brian, and, and again, thanks for having me on, yep. is I, I, would dis, I will discern between uh, special operations forces and U.S. Army special forces, because I think that I can speak to the latter uh, more effectively than the former as it pertains to, to an identity crisis and, and, and this notion of influence in the arena that we're in today. And, and, and when talking about Green Berets, I do believe there is an identity crisis uh, across the three areas that, that Ed talked about. I think he's right on the money. So just since, since you're in kind of agreement with, uh, with, with Colonel Crude on this, um, if the identity crisis within, as you said, just focusing on the Green Berets because that's your background, um, you know, how did it, how did this manifest itself and, and how did, can you kind of give us maybe your view on the history of, of, you know, was it 30 years ago? Was it five minutes ago? Um, how we got to where we are today and, and where the biggest challenges are in addressing it? Sure. You know, um, the first thing I would say, Brian, is like I, most of the work that I do right now after retiring from special forces eight years ago is I spend a lot of time in the civilian sector. Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100 companies, small and medium businesses, nonprofits. And what I do is I focus on influence. I focus on high stakes engagements, communications, using a lot of the old school interpersonal uh, attributes that, that I learned as a Green Beret and that I've worked on over the last eight years to turn into more of a, a true methodology. And here's what I'll tell you. In most of my engagements in the civilian sector, very few people 
really know what a green beret is. And that was when I first started to kind of like, you know, peek my, my eyebrows on that. I was like, huh, that's interesting. But also I encountered this when, when I, shortly before retirement, you know, five years out from retiring in the interagency world, I saw it a lot where, you know, three letter agencies really didn't know who we were as special forces. They knew who other soft organizations were, but not so much us. Um, and, and I just, I think that's always to me an indicator of a bit of an identity crisis when constituents don't know who you are and when your citizenry doesn't really know who you are. And what, what I've taken to, to help people understand that is I, I'm a storyteller and I try to use, you know, because the brain, every human brain is a metaphorical pattern matching organ. Like the brain makes sense of the world through story, right? So I use story to help people understand who Green Berets are pretty quickly. And I typically say a Green Beret is like a combination of uh, John Rambo, the La uh, Lawrence of Arabia and the Verizon guy or the Sprint guy or whatever the hell we call him these days, right? And, and what I mean by that is they are relationship-based connectors who just happen to be lethal, but only when it's necessary. Other, other times they work by, with, and through indigenous people and they help them stand up on their own and, and push back and achieve strategic effects that way. And, and you know, people instantaneously get that. And maybe that some might say, well, that's an oversimplification of what we do. But I think if you really think about those three avatars and you walk it back to the evolution of special forces from the OSS, uh, working with the Montagnards in Vietnam, like Captain Gillespie and his ilk in the National Geographic article. If you look at the Ma Bell campaign in Panama, you know, you always saw these elements of that surgical lethality of, of that Rambo avatar, that, um, you know, that interpersonal by, with, and through technique of the T.E. Lawrence approach, and then that catalyst that could walk the halls of any embassy and create these uh, amazing relationships, these eclectic networks that would bring people together that otherwise no one else could seem to bring together. And, and I do believe those three avatars mixed into a different cocktail in every environment are, are super relevant and they do describe who we are. And I, I think that we've moved away post 9-11 from those latter two avatars, the T.E. Lawrence approach and the, and the Verizon guy, that relationship management. Uh, I don't see the same kind of application of skill work to that that we do to that direct action avatar. So, and, and since you brought up OSS and, and, and just, you know, the evolution of <clears throat> what what the Green Berets are, what you know, and special operations in general too. But um, everything is significantly changed in terms of what we face on the battlefront, right? Um, the what I what I hear you just say is those three components, two of which are very non kinetic aspects, right? Um, it seems like maybe we're spending more more of our time in terms of training and and enhancing the skills of say Green Berets or other mm -hmm. special operators with more of the kinetic capabilities and not as much time on the non-kinetic is that would you agree with that and if in, in maybe kind of give us some more on how we could maybe improve our positioning there well i mean I, I think that's accurate and and if that was our only charter you know if surgical lethality was our only charter then great like i i think there's a lot of um components within the special operations forces community and when we talk about they should be getting more to influence i'm not sure i agree with that <laughs> you know i think they should stick to you know, swinging a pipe surgically and doing what they do. You know, I don't think there's necessarily a call for them to be more uh, attuned to engagement, for example, or influence. But when you look at our history and you look at the things that we have done for the nation at a strategic relevance level throughout history, it has always been some measure of by, with, and through and strategic influence that we've brought to the fight that no one else really brought. And so, yes, I do believe that we have over-indexed on the direct action piece. Now, don't get me wrong. Surgical lethality is the foundational cornerstone of the Green Beret. Like we are, you know, an extremely lethal force and we should always make that our foundation. But I believe that today's context, and really it's timeless, we need that Lorenzian by, with, and through interpersonal advisor. We need that Verizon guy that can walk the halls and implement relationship management and build you know, networks in the face of complexity. We have to have that. And if we don't, 
I think we face a level of irrelevance that not only is kind of dangerous to the force, but also it really, I think it, we fall short with what we're supposed to do nationally. So yeah, I think, I think that we've, we've, we've moved away from that certainly post 9-11, uh, mm-hmm. you know, 20 years of, of a certain type of warfare, we've kind of self-selected away from those other two avatars. Yeah, sure. And, and in terms of the actual, so the, the identity crisis, if you will, just to kind of harken back to that a little bit, um, I, I think I've, you know, don't forget I'm a, I'm a knuckle dragging Marine, so you got to bear with me here. Um, but the, the concept that, um, that Congress or, or the different users of these um, surgical lethal, lethal tools um, don't necessarily understand the identity of the Green Beret, um, I get that part. It, now, let me just pull the thread a little bit more. Do you think the Green Beret itself understands the identity that they are tasked to perform in its entirety, or, or is there more work to be done there? I've seen, and, and I'm speaking anecdotally, I, I can't speak to the level of data that Ed has. I mean, that, that guy has just really gone deep on this, but I can speak mm-hmm. anecdotally, but I think it's a, at least a twofold problem. I, I think one is there's at least some measure of willful um, hmm, omission of that requisite skill set that I talked about with interpersonal skills and, you know, that relationship management, that influence piece. I, I do believe that there's, there's just, frankly, it is, it is not as sexy as the direct action approach. You don't get the same kind of feedback from it. It's harder to train. It's squishy. It's nebulous. Um, and, and in my entire time in, in, in special forces in seventh group, where we do a lot of this by, with, and through in a semi-permissive environment, the front end work on that from a certification and training perspective was minimal, minimal. And so there just, there, there was not that much emphasis on it. So there's almost like a, to some degree, in some circles, there's a willful, like, you know, we just don't do it uh, because it, it doesn't have the same, uh, I feel like, uh, reciprocity feel that direct action has. Um, and then on, on the other side, I think in some cases, there are a lot of folks that came into special forces who were recruited specifically for that direct action approach and that surgical approach. And that's what they saw on the recruiting posters. And that's what they were told. And that's what they got to a large degree in, in, in theater. And so there's now, I think, a, a certain level of presence inside the regiment that also believes that's just who we are and that our past is either outdated and irrelevant or, you know, they were never exposed to that. So they don't they don't really have an appreciation for it. For example, anybody that was pre 9-11 and seventh group is referred to as the salsa brigade, right? I mean, I mean, seriously, like that, that gives you an idea of the in-group out-group mentality surrounding at one operational group pre 9-11 and post 9-11. And it's, yeah. it's yeah. striking. Yeah. That's uh, interesting. And, and I guess, so let me, um, let's go down that path a little bit in terms of understanding um, where we are today. And, you know, feeling, feeling like I, I have three children myself and, and I'm um, always concerned that the schools that uh, they go to, the instructors they have, the teachers they have, are maybe teaching to the test too much. Um, so that's where this question is coming from. And because recently, First Special Forces, you know, released a new vision and mission statement. One of the objections, <clears throat> I'm sorry, one of the obje- objectives focuses on certification and validation of skills prior to mission deployment. With, with that requirement, uh, can elements such as narrative development competence be objectively measured? Um, so there's the question. And again, I'll go back to kind of, if we're teaching to the test, are we really measuring the practicality of what they're going to see when they're, when they're out there? And again, understanding the, the competence that, that one has, whether it be the cultural competence or the, the abilities they have in the, the non-kinetics um, in particular, um, how are we measuring those and can we do that objectively? Well, if it's okay, I'll just kind of back up a little bit from that question. And, and, and what I will say is that, you know, I believe there's an opportunity in the work that Major General Brennan and his team have done uh, in the realm of innovation and relationships. You know, like I believe those two lines of effort offer, and, they're, and I think they're right, I, you know, all four lines of effort, but those two in particular really jump out at me as a, as a Green Beret, that that's a real place for uh, Green Berets to continue to carve out their real estate of relevance in mm-hmm. this current domain. And so to your question, you know, I think the opportunity here, Brian, is that 
the same, okay, so the same way that we work to improve, improve our hit rate with surgical lethality, training DA to the highest level, uh, I believe there's an opportunity for Green Berets to do the same thing and level up their engagement skills with that Verizon guy and with the, the TE Lawrence approach. And what I mean by that, in the last 10 years, there is a ton of data and science that helps us engage more effectively. Whereas when I went through the Q course, you know, in the, in the 90s, uh, and really before that too, you, if, to establish rapport, you either, had that, you either had that ability or you didn't. And if you didn't have it, you were washed out. And if you did have it, then you, you went and did great things. But rapport was talked about all the time, but it was really not trained. It was just expected that that was an instinctual attribute of the Green Beret. You can establish rapport or you cannot. We know now through a ton of, of, of just body of work stuff that's coming out in the human connection realm, mostly in the civilian sector, that rapport, relationships, reciprocity, uh, high stakes engagement, um, narrative competence, uh, active listening. These are things that elicit high levels of reciprocity from the other party that create social capital and relationships. And man, that's what SF has carved its niche on for decades. Why would we not bring science to the art of engagement the same way that we bring science to the art of DA? You know, there's a mix. And right now, I think the opportunity is to do that. And we're not doing that. We're, we're relying, I've, I've, I've taught at the Q course 18 alphas for several years now. And you know, my takeaway is that we're still relying heavily on instinct of human engagement uh, mm-hmm. at a basic fundamental level, right? And, and we could dial that up and we should because that's the real area, I think, for influence for Green Berets in, in the coming years is to get into these places and build deep relationships and create influence. And the last thing I'll say on this, Brian, is you know, influencing another human being to take action, there's a science to that. There's a skill set to that. And, you know, if you rely on instinct, your hit rate's going to be about 65, 70%. If you, if you dial in the skill and you bring to bear those old school interpersonal skills with the recent science of narrative competence and open-ended questions, like you can take your hit rate for engagement way up and create higher levels of reciprocity and move people. And I guess that's my, that's my answer to all of this is that there's a huge opportunity here within the last 10 years. There's a body of work around human connection that I don't, I mean, the, the civilian world that I work in is paying attention to it because it's a bottom line thing for them. But I don't think it has migrated in this, into, the, into the SF world yet. Yeah, so these are the, the soft skills, if you will, that are, that, um, you know, in, it, honestly, in the sales world and the, you know, business development, if you will, in, in, in the industry that I, you know, reside in, you quantify and you figure out metrics and ways to actually hone in you know, someone, you know, not just the inert capability, but the actual, um, the process they go through to, to practice, practice getting better at these soft skills, right? Um, so are, are there, are these defined by, by, you know, maybe it's at the advanced special operations level or, you know, for an animal nomad kind of thing, or, or is it, is it defined anywhere for, for a Green Beret or anyone going through this process that these are the soft skills that can be developed more than just, as you said, here's what it is, and you either have it or you don't. If you don't, sorry, you can't play with us. You know what I mean? I don't think it's defined. I, yeah. I don't. I, you know, again, I've done a lot of work at the institutional level. And if it is, I haven't seen it. Like, mm-hmm. so for example, <clears throat> you think about something like the definition of rapport, right? Mm-hmm. That, you know, as much as we use rapport in the Q course, I'm going to just look it up real quick here. I'm going to Google rapport. <laughs> um, so I'm going to hit it and here it is. A close and harmonious relationship in which the people or groups concerned understand each other's feelings or ideas and communicate well. And I always have the students when I teach this at Bragg, I have them look that up and they're like, mm-hmm. you know, like that one, that's it. You talk about a, a soft definition like, you know, harmonious it's empathy, it's listening, yeah. right? It's all that. And then, and then the fact that we even call it soft skills, I mean, there you go right there, right? Who's going to, you know, who in our community is going to say, yeah, man, let's do some soft skill training today, right? There's a, there's a negative bias to it right out of the gate, but guess what? The reality is if we're going to influence strategically, 
if we're going to create a relationship in an embassy, in a, in a village with a tribal elder or with a partner force, influence is influence. Rapport is rapport. It's not a soft skill. It's a human skill. Like it's what humans have been doing for a quarter million years. The good news is we have uncovered a whole body of work around this. We have uncovered as much rigor and science in this approach as we have in modern day cephalic. It just, it just hasn't migrated in yet. It's over in the business world. I've, I've been working around it for eight years now. And, you know, you talked about sales. The, the, the sales leads in a Fortune 500 that crush it are the ones who understand and integrate soft skills into their daily engagement. It, you think about the iconic Green Berets that we read about and we study like Captain Vernon Gillespie in the National Geographic article where he put down the Montagnard uprising. That was all interpersonal work. Every bit of it, he had no authority over those folks and he was outnumbered 100 to one. And, and I think if you look at the iconic Green Berets throughout our history, they had that, they had that set component of Rambo, Lawrence and the Verizon guy and they could always mix it up to just the right cocktail for the yeah. right moment. That's what we bring that I think no one else can bring. However, there's a deficit on the cognizant skill training of those last two avatars. And, and, and again, you know, it doesn't have to be because that, that opportunity is there. You know, we just gotta, we just gotta migrate to it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and but do you actually, you actually believe though, that it can be made, like these soft skills oh. can be articulated, yeah. measured, and, and taught, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I see it all the time. So let me give you a couple of examples. Just These are just a couple, right? So when you go into it, when you go into a high stakes moment, whether you are briefing your battalion commander, the ambassador, or, you know, or, or, or a partner force, if you use a PowerPoint deck, which all soft units that I've ever worked around, not only do they use PowerPoint, it's atrocious, how much PowerPoint we use. Like it, it hurts. We use so much PowerPoint and there's studies out right now that show that within 30 seconds of ma'am, thank you for your time. 90% of the content is forgotten, yep. right? Because you're engaging working memory and you're, you're using, you know, abstract thought and working memory to get, try to get your most critical idea across. However, if you go into that same engagement, and you use a narrative vehicle, a well-told story to deliver your idea to the other party, it will most likely pass through all of the mechanisms and defenses of the listener's brain, and it will land squarely on the limbic brain where you will create emotional resonance, you will, you will provide context, you will provide meaning, and the, the, the long-term memory is engaged. Um, and I'll give you an example, Brian. I, 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 I just taught at an operational group and I was teaching uh, uh, special operations forces liaison elements that go into embassies and engage, right? And there was a captain there that I had trained four years ago in the Q course. And I, I kick off my training with one particular story of what led me to become a Green Beret. Four years later, I asked him to recount that story and he could do it almost verbatim. And that's my point. So narrative is huge. Active listening, using thoughtful, open-ended questions to engage another person. Uh, there's a whole science around questionology right now that we're not even tapping into. And finally, just nonverbals, attunement, how you present yourself to another person, how you warm up, how you prepare to walk into that space and own that room uh, can take your cortisol levels up and your, uh, excuse me, your cortisol levels down and your testosterone levels up. You can render yourself in a parasympathetic state so that you're not all elevated up here and wondering about how you're doing and looking like you don't trust yourself. Now, those are all measurable skills, right? They're all engagement skills. We, we don't train on hardly any of them. And if we did, our hit rate would go up demonstrably in terms of reciprocity and long-term relationships. So yes, they, they are measurable. We measure them in the civilian world all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Now that's, and, and it's great to hear you say this. And I think, you know, it, maybe this discussion seems like it's a bit um, on the pioneering edge, but the, I, I feel like these are things that um, certainly um, having been in a couple of wars myself and, and you certainly with your experience, um, we, we all know this to be true inside. It's just, yeah. 
you just don't figure it out until you, you come back, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. But actually, listening to people is what is what's important. You know? It's the stuff that our grandparents actually. It, it, you know what? It's actually the stuff that those old school NCOs taught us back in the day. Certainly in in the SF regiment, this was stuff that my mentors as NCOs and warrant officers taught me. The difference, Brian, is we were operating on instinct then. We we were relegated to instinct, you know, and you can't train instinct. And if there is indeed an identity crisis within the regiment. And I think there is, and we're going to move toward a more indigenous approach and become the nation's premier partnership force, or at least continue to ascend in that role. And we're going to do strategic influence. How are you going to teach instinct to young green berets who spent most of their career in Afghanistan or Iraq, you know, and, and I, I believe there is such an amazing body of work out there. Uh, in high stakes engagements, in, in, in rapport building, in uh, narrative competence, in active listening, uh, questionology, in, in uh, nonverbal skills, hospitality, like all, there's just a whole host of ways to up, level up your engagement um, that we used to have to use instinct and we don't have to anymore. Like there's a, there's a ton of stuff out there that can be brought in. It's not a heavy lift. It doesn't take away from our lethality it just puts more quantifiable tools in the kit bag for the Green Beret to use in each of these situations. Same with relationship management. You know, in the banking industry uh, and in the customer service industry, relationship management is not just a skill, it's a job title. There are people who do that for a living. And, you know, we talk about how we pride ourselves in institutional relationships in SF, but where's the science behind relationship management? We lose relationships all the time because we don't know how to manage them at an institutional level. And we don't even know how to talk about that. So, you know, I think it's a, it's frankly, I think it's an exciting opportunity because it's the craft behind the trade craft. It is old school, but it's bringing science to the art of connection. And, and that's a, that's to me, really good news for the SF regiment. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it really boils down to solving problems, right? That's what, and the only way you can solve a problem is to understand the, all of the factors and all the variables, right? So, um, well, yeah, I mean, the other party, when you're dealing with another person, when you're dealing with another human being, uh, they look at, when they look at you, they, they, they're really assessing two things. Does this person understand my goals? And does this, under, does this person, is this person relatable to my pain? That's it. That's how we navigate the world. Do you get my goals and are you relatable to my pain? And if you can demonstrate that, you know, one or both of those, and then you can synthesize that with your goals, you're going to move that person. You're going to influence that person. They're going to take action and you're going to create reciprocity and accelerate trust. There's a science to that. And I think it's time we got to get, we got to get after that. If we're really going to step into um, the role that's waiting for us, you know, in the 21st century as Green Berets. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let me, so let me shift to one last, uh, one last question here. It's been great so far. Thank you. Um, so, you know, it's I'll relate it to myself. My, my father was a, a Lieutenant Colonel uh, arm, uh, tank commander uh, back in the sixties. And um, so he had to um, deal with the fact that uh, he had a son who enlisted in the Marine Corps um, infantry, no doubt. Uh, and then went into language and intel and stuff. But but the um, the reinventing that went on in our family about us being a marine family as opposed to an army family, um, you know, was uh, was well fun for me. Maybe maybe less fun for my father. Although he's he's won the last uh, five army navy matchups, I think. So I'll, I'll I'll keep suffering through that for until we can turn that around. Um, but this so posing this back in the green beret kind of um, discussion, um, you know. We, we all have to reinvent ourselves throughout the process of our individual lives and institutions like the Green Berets, um, one could argue, maybe have to do that as well. And we talked a little bit about that in the beginning, um, but how do you think they reinforce their role within special forces, um, specifically as it pertains to information operations? So so you talked a little bit about how the, you know, two of the three kind of um, elements of, of a, a Green Beret really are in these non-kinetic areas that I think almost define information operations, um, at least from a, from a tactical perspective. Um, so how do we, how do Green Berets reinforce that role to become more critical to mission success within the IO kind of construct? We got to come to terms with who we are. Mm -hmm. First of all, you know, you got, we got, we got, we got to figure out, we got to make sure we know who we are and it's written. It can't just be, you know, yes, a top down directive is necessary, but, but as a regiment, we need to come to terms with that. That's important. Because people sniff it out if you don't, 
I mean, that's the truth. If you don't know who you are collectively, people will sniff that out a mile away. And we're deluded if we think otherwise. That's number one. Number two is we got to tell our story. You know, Donald Miller in his book, Story Brand, he says, if you confuse, you lose. And that's the truth. And, and what I believe is as a, as a regiment for years, we have struggled to tell our story. And I don't know if it's the quiet professional thing. I don't know if we outsource IO as an afterthought to another organization or, you know, the IO guy, but, but we are not telling our story. And I, and I know that because as I navigate the world just on the periphery of SF, on the outside, people don't know who we are. And the people who think they know who we are have it wrong. And so I believe, Brian, we've got to get our organizational narrative tight. We have to be able to communicate who we are, why we exist, and what we do in the world. And here's the most important part. We have to communicate it to relevant stakeholders in a way that they see our role as a supporting guide to their journey. Like we have to be able to tell the Green Beret story to Congress and to partner nations and to ambassadors and country teams in such a way that they see themselves as the hero in that narrative and the Green Beret as someone that's showing up to help them fulfill on what they're supposed to do. That's true narrative competence and that's organizational storytelling and i don't see us doing that and until we do that there's going to be confusion and lack of clarity on who we are and when that happens people just shut you down they just they just dismiss it it's particularly in a world where the average attention span of an adult human is eight seconds I and mean, that's like a second less than a goldfish and so you know, we have to be able to have a clear, a clear message and a clear message is a narrative, an organizational story that's well told and well understood inside and outside the regiment. And we can do it. We just have to get serious about it. And I hope that, you know, the work that's been done on the mission and vision, like I, I think it's amazing. The, the next step as we work internally is to really get that organizational narrative strong and out there uh, to, to help people understand the relevance we bring to the fight. Sure, sure. Now, the power of a narrative, that's uh, certainly a theme to come out of this. It's yeah. timeless. It's timeless. And it's why it's why ISIS is able to recruit the way they do. It's, yeah, it, it, right. it, it's an agnostic tool. But frankly, I don't think it's one that we've really taken seriously inside special forces the way that we should. Sure, sure. And so um, before I wrap up, I, I wanted to just uh, a uh, personal uh, preference here. I'll take the the onus um, to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, Hero's journey. I, you know, I just think it's fantastic uh, the work you guys are doing, and um, just wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe throw a plug in for the play. That um, hopefully someday, when the pandemic releases its grip, we'll we'll be able to uh, see in person um, uh, again or or whatever. But just wanted to a thank you for all the work Hero's journey does, but also um, give you an opportunity to t tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, you know, I had a really crappy transition. I, I retired on my terms. I was doing commercial real estate. I was doing contract work. It was, you know, on the surface, it looked great, but below the surface, it was not good. And uh, I, I lost my connection to my purpose. Uh, I had a lot of demons come up for me and I, and I found myself doing what everybody else wanted me to do except me. And that sent me to a really dark place where I almost took my own life. And it was... Uh, sharing my story with other veterans who were in that dark place that brought me out of that. Uh, I fell in love with the power of narrative and the power of storytelling to take our struggle and repurpose it in the service of others. I, I call it the generosity of scars. I think it's something that as veterans, we have to do for our brothers and sisters in this time. We have to, you know, we have to use our star scars, our struggle and repurpose it uh, through narrative for other people. And uh, that just, that really resonated with me more and more as I became a professional storyteller in the corporate world. Um, I started studying uh, acting as a way to communicate more effectively. And uh, uh, one of my mentors said, you should write a play about the war. So I did, and it was really for therapy. It was to help me just um, tell the stories of a lot of Green Beret buddies who didn't come home and and just you know, uh, memorialize their them and their families. And so I did. I wrote a play called Last Out: Elegy of a Green Beret. It's about a Green Beret team sergeant who's killed in the very first scene, and he wants to ascend to Valhalla, but he's holding on to something and he can't let go. So his buddies, operators, come down from Valhalla and they take him back through his life. They become the people in his life that made his heart pump the most blood. 
and they show him his life again from the time he goes to selection, Q course, gets married, 9-11, and then back and forth to Afghanistan. Uh, and then finally he figures out what he's holding on to. And it, it takes the audience through not the first end that we always see the movies about, but the last out, those Green Berets and their families who go back time and time again when everybody else has moved on and they're still doing it. And uh, to complete my midlife crisis, I decided that I would play the role of Master Sergeant Danny Patton. So at age 49, I took acting lessons for a year. We took it on the road. And you know what? It's done really well. We got Tom Brokaw has has uh, has uh, interviewed us, CBS News. We toured 16 cities. It's streaming on Fox Nation. Uh, and we just recently opened a Veteran Performing Arts Center in Tampa where we'll be performing the play a lot during the year and other shows for veterans. Uh, so, you know, our, our nonprofit, The Hero's Journey, is all about helping warriors find their voice and tell their story and getting that narrative competence as they come home. And we use the play to show the power of story. So thanks for letting me put it out there. If anyone wants to learn more about it, you can go to theheroesjourney.org, H-E-R-O-E-S, theheroesjourney.org, and you know, support us on our mission. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I'll, we'll, we'll get that up on the screen uh, for, for everyone watching. I mean, really like, you know, the, the, I, some people in the midlife crisis go out and buy a, you know, a, a convertible or a Corvette or something. And um, your, your uh, choice to write a play and, and do everything that you're doing. I mean, truly your the, the, the courage it takes to share your scars with the world certainly um, are a gift to me. And I know, uh, you know, thousands of other people. So I appreciate it. Thanks so much. I feel like I'm telling everybody's story. Certainly my brothers that I served with in the regiment, but, but guys like you see the play and they came up and they say, you know, that was my, that was me up there. And then the cool thing is their wife or their kids are with them and, you know, they can see what dad did or what mom did. And, and that means everything to me to be able to tell someone else's story and let them locate themselves on that stage. That's as good as it'll get. Yeah, man, it's, it's powerful and impactful. I, I highly recommend everyone check it out. But um, yeah, thanks, bro. You know, again, thank thank you so much. I mean, we covered a lot. I, I love the um, the the. I can't get the the image of Rambo, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, and the Verizon guy out of my head now. Right, um, it's a metaphor. We can't. Your brain won't let. That's my point. That's my point. Is like our brain is a metaphorical pattern matching organ. If we're not telling stories that have metaphors and framing. We're miss, we're missing, we're leaving social capital on the table. Yeah, absolutely. No, and and you know, and I, I think the other thing I, I loved hearing you talk about was how soft skills are are not um, not glamorous, but but and they're harder to develop, honestly. And and but and and again, not to take away from the importance of the of the surgical lethality, as you put it. I think that's a key component, um, but just understanding that it complements the other other sides of of the equation as well. I think is important. Um, well, what using I love science. That- yeah, what I love about our special forces culture is that we do have that lethality. We do have that Lorenzian skill and we do have that Verizon guy catalyst relationship skill. And it's the operator that can work that toggle on himself or herself to show up in the right chemistry for that situation. I mean, damn, like that is, that is quintessentially what the Green Beret has done since we were founded. And now we've got a science that's available to us to get after that the same way that we get after a direct action target and, yeah. and rehearse that and work through that. And, and, you know, I think it really bodes well for us going into these uh, complex times. Yeah. Abs- I mean, and that's, and that is it just using be allowing science to, and not that, you know, using science is new to the special forces world, but, but allowing it to, work in the soft skills side, using it to develop your ability to upgrade your rapport. And as you put it, and these are all, you know, and then the actually being able to measure that, I think is a key thing that I heard you say that, that, that really that's exciting to me because once you can start measuring it, you can get better at it, right? You can improve it, right? That's, it's, you know, the process and identify, figure out where the breakdown is and make it better next time. That's, and that's what we have to do in the information operations world, right? Exactly. And I, and particularly in influence, and I wouldn't let the term science run me off. And what I mean by that is like, for example, if you're out on the flat range and, you know, any green beret knows the ball and dummy drill, right? Where, where you, where you use this drill to get better with your pistol. And that is science. Like that's a, that's an application of science to get technically more proficient at your, uh, at your, at your weaponry. All right. Well, you take the same approach if, if I put you in an engagement where you're going to rehearse your engagement with the ambassador and you do role reversal and you play the ambassador 
for two repetitions after doing homework on that ambassador and you play her as accurately as you can and everybody else fishbowls you, that's science. And the odds are your hit rate and that engagement is going to be way higher in terms of influence than if you just talked about it in the truck ride over about what you're going to say, which is a lot of times what we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, often the um, these elements are saved till the last second and they, they should probably be part of the entire process, right? Um, yeah. And I, I, I did want to, I'm sorry, say that again? Well, particularly for our line of work, I think yeah. cool. in some areas, you know, instinct is, okay, that's what you got because that's not, you know, that's not your primary uh, approach. But for Green Berets, influence is huge for us. And so we can't rely on just instinct in this arena that we're in right now. That's, that's, a, that's not a good idea. Yeah, certainly you want to influence your adversaries, but even, you know, as, as you pointed out, a Green Beret's mission is often leveraging the, the tools and resources that he'll have in, in country, and that may be partners. And, and if you can't influence them effectively, then, you know, you're, you're def, left without a paddle, so to speak. So yeah. and these, um, are low, these are low trust environments, right? So yeah. these are high stakes, no fail, low trust environments. So, yeah. you know, understanding how trust works and how you actually can bridge that through old school human engagement you can accelerate trust in one meeting, but back to that, back to that uh, old school definition of rapport, as you put it. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, I saw the other thing I was going to comment on is I don't think anyone, I myself, I'm not going to hate that you're, you're knocking the PowerPoints. So I'm going to have to show that to my bosses and see if we can get onto a more narrative anecdotal deck, as opposed to the, the 40 slides we have right now. But I, you know, I think these are the types of things that are going to move us forward and expanding in the world of IO, right. And, and, using our own skills. And I think maybe the total theme of what I'm hearing a lot of what you're talking about is you have to be a bit introspective personally, every maybe Green Beret, but everyone who's in this IO world has to understand where their strengths and weaknesses are so that they can apply them to the spectrum of the information operations world, the influence world, right? There's a strong body of work, Brian, that says that all modern people have disconnected from our nature. We've been on this earth for 250,000 years. We've been modern for about 250 years and we've completely disconnected from what's below the iceberg. We are meaning seeking, emotional, social creatures. That's who we are. And we've disconnected from that. And the reality is that the first thing I do is I, 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 talk, I say, look, we got to get reconnected to our nature. We got to know who we are. We have to understand how reciprocity works. We have to understand how status and honor works, shame, feud, vengeance, hospitality. These are all the primal characteristics of human dynamics that are still with us today. And if we yeah. understand that and we can get below the waterline and, 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 and leverage that or not let it act on us, depending on the situation. I mean, if you do that, then you'll know that story has been used literally for 70,000 years since a, uh, a cataclysmic volcano went off to help us survive by providing narrative transportation of traumatic events so that we experienced it as if it were our own event. That's why we love the storyteller because we feel like we were in the story. That's 70,000 years old. So if we get down below the surface and we study narrative theory and story structure, we can, we can take that PowerPoint and we can now lead it with a story or we can even make the PowerPoint follow the nine elements of a story, which are gonna land right on the limbic brain and they're going to go with you. PowerPoint's yeah. fine, but it should be an aid to narrative, not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got to tell you, I um, um, and I feel lucky to have gotten the chance to ch to chat with you, and I'm sure uh, anyone who's watching will also feel the same. I I think um, it's great uh, what you're doing with your energy, and as much as your transition uh, was not ideal, um, I think many of us can say the same thing. Uh, you certainly are heading in a direction that makes it a lot easier for a lot more people. So, so kudos to you and thanks for all the hard work you do and all of your insight on this topic. It's really just fantastic having you in our community. So I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Brian. I wanted to be a Green Beret since I was 14 and being able to just comment on a regiment that I love so much and, and so many of my brothers are still with and it just, it means everything to me. And so I, I really am I'm very grateful for the experience I had in Special Forces and to you for having me on to let me talk about how we can continue to stay relevant because that's all I care about is how we stay <laughs> relevant to the nation. Yeah, certainly our pleasure uh, for sure. And I uh, look forward to maybe another conversation in the future. That'd be great. Right on. All right. Well, thank you for watching. We hope these uh, con conversations continue to inform and inspire you as we all look for ways to better our global understanding and make a positive impact. Until next time, 
stay healthy and stay safe.